I'm joined today by Dr. Yasmin Hurd. She is a professor of psychiatry, neuroscience, and pharmacology at the Icon School of Medicine. She is also the director of the Center for Addiction Disorders at Mount Sinai. Dr. Hurd, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Now, you've proposed uh, what many are calling a novel solution to the opioid epidemic, and it centers around a substance called cannabidiol. Um, now, tell us a bit about cannabidiol. This is not just marijuana, is it? No, so cannabidiol is one of the cannabinoids in the marijuana plant. So THC, which everyone knows, you know, produces the euphoria, the high, and it's the highest ratio in the marijuana plant. Cannabidiol used to be like the second highest cannabinoid in the plant, and that's gone down on the street plants um, today. And cannabidiol we found to have no rewarding effects, but to inhibit heroin seeking behavior in our animal models that we then um, have started to translate into our human clinical studies. So cannabidiol doesn't have the euphoric effects. Is, is there any, are there any pleasant effects? Are there any uh, addictive properties of cannabidiol that, that uh, may differ from THC? No, so cannabidiol, um, when um, it's given to either humans or, or rats, um, it does not produce the high or it doesn't associate with any other drug um, that produces a reward. Um, mainly what it does, even in, in human studies, you see that it, it decreases anxiety, for example. It will reduce, um, not only in our studies, but others have shown um, drug craving, it will reduce opioid withdrawal signs in a number of animal models. So the rewarding effects are not there. Animals won't self-administer cannabidiol. Humans don't find it rewarding. So tell us a little bit about these these animal models and the effects you've seen. Um, you have uh, these are mice that are uh, addicted to heroin. Can you tell us how that works? Yeah. So these are mainly rat studies. Um, so what you do is you allow animals to self-administer heroin. So they control their own heroin intake. And in this way, you have aspects that we see in humans in terms of the motivation to take the drug, the individual differences that you see in. Um, someone oh, I'm liking the drug more than others and just the cognitive effects that are there. So by controlling their own intake we then gave them cannabidiol to see whether or not it would impact that. And what we saw was that cannabidiol it didn't really impact the actual heroin intake when if heroin was already in the system but days later it would decrease the the um, drug seeking behavior or drug taking behavior if you introduce the animals to the same environment that they would normally associate with heroin intake. So normally if you show uh, an environmental cue, when an animal gets a drug, a light would go on for example, so the classic operant conditioning. And then they start to associate the light with getting the drug. So when you introduce them to that light, they will start pressing a, the lever as that would normally have given them heroin. And cannabidiol decreases that heroin seeking behavior. And how did you come across cannabidiol? Were, were these experiments initially using uh, marijuana itself or THC? What was the biologic rationale to, to target this particular substance? Yeah, actually it was, our initial projects were not focused on cannabidiol. Most of the research that I had done for years was looking at the impact of developmental exposure to marijuana and looking at its, um, its effects on adult behavior and brain. And so normally when you carry out animal studies, you would use THC and you'd call that marijuana. And studying THC, we had always seen that it increased heroin seeking behavior and heroin taking behavior when the animals became adults. And one day I said to my group, because there are many more cannabinoids in the plant than just THC, so we should perhaps look at other cannabinoids. And cannabidiol was, like I said, the second most um, concentrated cannabinoid in the plant, so we said, let's go for that one. And we were very surprised when we actually saw really an opposite effect when it comes to heroin-seeking behavior. So our studies were not really designed initially to look at cannabidiol. It was just seeing if any cannabinoid would do the same thing as THC.
So that certainly leads to a question about, about humans who might be smoking marijuana and getting all those cannabinoids into their system. What, what does the data tell us about human use of marijuana and heroin? Does marijuana, in your opinion, potentiate heroin addiction because of the high levels of THC, or do we not see that in humans as much? So it's a, it's a two-part answer because epidemiological data clearly has shown that um, especially the younger you start with marijuana use, there is usually an increased association, for example, with um, the use of heavier drugs, quote unquote, heavy drugs such as um, heroin later in life. And that's been the controversial gateway hypothesis because we clearly know that many people will smoke marijuana and not go on to have any addiction disorders later in life. But it was just looking at the temporal um, the temporal pattern of people who are heroin abusers, what did they start with first? And so that association has been there. Animal models have validated that the early THC exposure does increase a heroin self-administration. But that's the developing brain. When you look at the adult brain, we actually don't see that greater sensitivity necessarily. And as said, um, if adults are smoking marijuana, it's you see in some um, states right now that have legalized marijuana that those states have a decrease now in opiate use, opiate overdose deaths, and there are some pros um, retrospective um, studies of, of, of clients in the dispensaries when they've increased their marijuana intake for chronic pain, for example, you've seen that there's been a decrease in their opioid use. So the developing brain may be differentially sensitive to marijuana than the adult brain and an adult with an opioid um, use disorder. So when people are smoking marijuana, there are also different strains of the marijuana, and marijuana strains that have more cannabidiol might be more effective. And this is one of the things we don't know because there's very little evidence-based research to start really teasing apart what particular strains of marijuana, what particular populations, individuals may, be bene may benefit from the marijuana. But clearly there's some interaction there that I think needs to be explored. So you're setting up a really interesting um, dichotomy, a sort of yin and yang between THC with its euphoria inducing and potentially an anxiety inducing effects and cannabidiol, which doesn't have the euphoria and potentially is anxiolytic. It sounds like THC, because that's the thing that leads to euphoria, is being bred more and more into the strains we see. Is that true at, if in, in terms of medical marijuana dispensaries and even recreational dispensaries as well, or is that street marijuana? In other words, can I go to a dispensary and say, you know, hey, I want the strain that has a bit more cannabidiol in it? Yes, so um, a lot of the dispensaries, in fact, that's one of the, their, um, you know, their advertisement is that you can really find the strain to fit your particular symptom. Um, obviously, it's not a clinical um, uh, validated or evidence based necessarily, but the dispensaries have many v varieties of strains and, and many um, uh, formulations are coming out now where you will have higher CBD in that particular strain. So the dispensaries, um, for at least the ones that I know of, are, are working towards that and really trying to provide what they consider to be medical marijuana that is not um, strains that are not very high in THC. I'll ask you about a political question here, which is not something we usually go into, but, um, but the press secretary, Sean Spicer, had mentioned that the administration would potentially crack down more on decriminalization and legalization of marijuana at the state level, and he cited the opioid epidemic as a reason for that crackdown. From what I'm hearing from you, it doesn't sound like you would agree with that logic. Is that the case? Um, you know, this is clearly a hot button topic and a, a difficult one to, um, to really um, tease apart. But clearly, as I said, a number of the epidemiological studies sh don't show that there's an association between the opioid epidemic, at least, and marijuana use. If, in fact, it's showing that marijuana, um, and perhaps it's the cannabidiol strains, um, are associated with reduced opioid intake. When you talk about legalization from the state to state, 
you know, for me, I mainly care about the developing brain. And so um, teens and so on getting exposure, and even young kids you see more and more getting exposure to the drug, because we know that the developing brain, um, marijuana has a different impact than on the adult brain. So these are these legal and political issues. Um, I, I do think that we need a federal policy that allows for research to develop evidence-based treatments and evidence-based policy so that um, Congress and the lay public and physicians can better treat and understand the impact of marijuana, good, bad, or otherwise. But I think without having a federal policy to make it easier for scientists and physicians to conduct research, we're going to still be in this kind of no man's land where one state wants to do one thing and another state not, and the federal government um, giving mixed messages. So hopefully we can get towards a more cohesive um, policy on being able to develop medical marijuana for true symptoms, true diseases that people need help with. Well, Dr. Hurd, it is truly a fascinating area of research. Uh, congratulations on your work so far, and we look forward to, uh, to seeing more of this type of work in the future. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks very much.